philosophy lexicon. First entry, I think the first concept I want to talk about that's important in understanding philosophy is the difference between subjective and objective. So this is a division that can be made in several different ways. It's not uh, unanimous of exactly how to divide this up, the subject of some controversy. But I think a good beginning approach is to think of the subjective is a claim which uh, the truth of which depends upon some person or group of people's state of mind. If it depends upon somebody's state of mind, then it is subjective. If it does not depend for its truth on the contents of anybody's head, then it is an objective claim. So obvious examples um, that I prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla ice cream is a subjective fact. Notice I, notice I call it a fact. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, why is it subjective? Because it depends upon my actual preference. And notice that you don't have any way of measuring my preference apart from taking my word for it or observing my behavior. That I would always, given a choice, I would always choose chocolate over vanilla. Notice that your, access, your conclusions about my preference, my subjective preference, are based upon my objective speech and activity. Okay, so they're objective signs of my objective preference, but you can't access that, that subjective preference directly. Okay, you, have to, you have to take my word for it or observe my actions. Okay. A couple of points to make about subjective and objective claims. Do not fall into the very common trap of assuming that everything subjective is arbitrary. Okay, subjective does not equal arbitrary. That's why I've spoken of subjective truths or of claims whose truth depends upon somebody's state of mind. This comes about, I think, in part because of No Child Left Behind and in part because high school students are often challenged to sort different claims into two columns, facts and opinions. And they tend to put moral judgments as well as subjective judgments into the category of opinion. And they think, well, opinions can be changed at will, and so subjective things can be changed at will, and so they're ultimately arbitrary. This is not at all the case. There are subjective facts and there are subjective falsehoods. I can make true or, fal I can make true or false claims about somebody's state of mind or set of preferences. An example. In a criminal case, the subjective state of mind of the defendant is one of the primary objects of the inquiry. The jury has to come to some conclusion about whether the defendant intended to kill the victim or not. And that's purely a question of subjective intent. How do they measure it? You can't peer into the person's head. You can't trust him to tell the truth about it if he's on trial for his life. What do you look at? You look at speech and behavior. You look at speech and behavior before, during, and after the incident that indicate consciousness of guilt or consciousness of innocence. Okay. And then you draw a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt that either he did or he did not intend to do it. I'd note also that you will find people taking refuge in subjective claims when they wish to avoid controversy. This is where you find the very common subjectivization of all judgments. Well, to me, the Holocaust was wrong. Right? To me, it would be wrong to hold people in slavery and cut them up into little pieces. But I don't know about, about everybody else. This is, I think, a psychological defense mechanism or a social defense mechanism. Maybe it goes along with trying to have good manners and show multicultural respect for other people and other ways of life and other judgments. But it amounts to making nothing but subjective claims. Right? My view is that X without ever having to defend X. I think one of the things that this shows is that we as a people or as a culture have fallen out of the habit of philosophical dispute. We, people just don't have the skill to be able to engage in philosophical debate, to make an objective claim and defend it. So they end up making a lot of subjective claims. The other point I'll make about the sort of retreat into the subjective in speech is that this is what politicians who are caught lying will do virtually all the time. Right. Were you at that meeting where illegal activity was discussed? I really don't recall. I just don't remember being at that meeting. So, well, we have a photograph of you at that meeting. I don't remember being at that meeting. I'm sorry. I, if, I, if I could remember, I would tell you, but I really don't remember. Don't remember signing that document. Don't remember paying that money to that hitman. Um, I just don't remember. Then as, as long as I say I don't remember, I'm making claim, subjective claims that are going to be contradicted only by somebody carefully collecting a lot of evidence about my contemporary speech and actions that would indicate that your subjective state was not. And most politicians, I think, will judge, probably correctly, that if they kick up enough, du enough dust around the issue that their hardcore partisans will hold on to them and say, this is just a reasonable dispute between people fighting, um, and the candidate maybe is not lying. Okay. So that's all I have to say about subjective and objective. Um, add that to your lexicon, and we'll do something else, uh, something else next time.
cách 